full commitment to be a follower of Jesus. Those folks will be gone. Those who haven't made that commitment will be hanging around. So, so every time we turn a page tonight, we're going to say, we are not here. So that, to me, that helps me temper some of the questions that I've had in, in previous times when I've gone through the book of Revelation. Because I'm trying to, I, I get caught up in trying to assign things of today, of things that are being recorded by John in his vision when we're not here. Make sense? Okay, so this is kind of like for informational purposes only. So, all right, let's jump in. Uh, this chapter, uh, this chapter describes a break or an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpets, just as there, wa there was between the sixth and seventh seals. God delays but doesn't cancel his final judgment. In verse 1 of chapter 10, a mighty angel brings John a message for the world, which is in verse 11. John de derives no joy from this message. He must make known to those who reject God. It says in that verse that it is sweet to the taste, but sour to the stomach, uh, which means that it may sound good to begin with, but the reality of what that message is uh, is, is, is judgment coming to unbelievers. Uh, that's kind of the summation of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Uh, in this chapter, uh, we see without question God is dealing with the Jews. The Jewish temple has been rebuilt, and the Jewish nation is worshiping, worshiping there again. So right now, let's, let's like, you know, put a little pin in this. We understand that for this to happen, uh, it hasn't happened. So we can't be in the midst of what's going on in these chapters because one of the most telltale signs is the reestablishment, the rebuilding uh, of the temple in the city of Jerusalem uh, so that Jewish people can return to uh, the worship uh, and the sacrifices at the altar. So, so that's a, a key indicator we ain't there yet. All right. So it says, uh, what will the Antichrist do to this temple? And you can go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, and I've added verses 1 through 4, Daniel 9, 27, and Matthew 24, 15. So let's look at those as we come together with our answer. So uh, Revel, our, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 1 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Verse 2 says, Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Verse 3, Don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness, now I added in there the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. Verse 4, he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God, that's, notice the small g there, God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he is himself God. Capital G. See the huge difference there. That's 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 4. Daniel 9, 27 says this. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And verse 27 goes on. And as a climax to all of his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. And then finally, Matthew 24, 15 says this, The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, Pay attention. Okay, lots of scripture there, lots of references. Remember, 
you know, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians in the 50s, uh, 30 years after the resurrection. Daniel wrote it about 500 years before Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus speaking from Matthew was like boots on the ground representing God. So, so three perspectives of three different time frames, all saying the same thing. And this is what I put in my blank uh, on that page. The Antichrist will stop the sacrifices and offerings in the temple and will desecrate it. The Antichrist will stop the sacrifices and offerings in the temple and will desecrate it. So now let me say a little bit about some history here. I just I think it's important. When Daniel was having his vision, it would be easy for those folks who came after Daniel, especially those in, in 163 BC, uh, when the temple, the second or the temple that was there in Jerusalem was desecrated. Uh, by a Greek army soldier named Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he, uh, he had gone to Egypt. He was one of the four generals, uh, or four generals that received inheritances when Alexander the Great died, and it was passed down to him. Uh, and he, his area was there, uh, kind of in the Holy Land and north into Turkey. And so he decided he was going to go to Egypt and, and win the territory in Egypt. And he got thoroughly beat. And so he was on his way back home uh, with his tail between his legs. And he came to Jerusalem. And he was so upset for losing to the Egyptians uh, that he decided to take it out on the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And so he took and desecrated the temple by sacrificing and killing a hog on the altar in the temple of, of God. And so it was desecrated. So now it'd be easy for folks to say, well, that's already happened. Antiochus Epiphany is this, this abomination to God, said and done. But yet Jesus is speaking. Now almost 160 years later, or 100 and, almost 200 years later, by saying the thing that Daniel talked about is, hasn't happened yet. It's still coming. So, so Jesus is pointing to future stuff and not what some people may have thought Daniel was talking to stuff that happened in 163 B.C. So you might, if you're doing, you know, like, googly researching on this, you might run across that. I'm just telling you, uh, Jesus negates that happening in 163. Daniel is talking about the end time stuff like what we are. Uh, so the answer is the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices and offerings in the temple and will desecrate it. Another thing, if you remember last week, Leon brought up a great point that he had read this article uh, about a group of Levitical priests today still being trained to serve in the temple. Uh, and, and I read that article, it said to me, great article. Uh, but they're, they're validating what we're reading right here is that there comes a point uh, when the Jewish people have reestablished the temple uh, and they are worshiping there uh, before the culmination of the end of the world. After the rapture and before uh, the final battle that we'll read about next week in chapter 19 and 20. So, uh, yes, uh, but when we get to heaven, as we'll read next week, there is no temple because God, God's presence is the temple that they worship. So, I appreciate that. So, in case you're wondering about who the Antichrist is, I can tell you. It says so. Remember this in 1 John? We talked about a couple weeks ago, 1 John 2, chapter, verse 22 says this. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an anti-Christ. So anybody that is, gets this, now that's a small a, you will see in other uh, instances it has to be a capital A, which is the ultimate antichrist at the end of the world. But anybody who denies that, that Jesus is the Lord uh, is, is against Christ. So that's simply what it means. So we go on, it says, How long will the holy city be trodden underfoot? Uh, it says by Gentiles, but I inserted the word on the unbelievers. Because I, I, I was uncomfortable with the word Gentiles, because guess what you are? You're a Gentile. This is by unbelieving Gentiles. Let's, let's call it that. Uh, in Revelation 11.2. Uh, so what does 11.2 says? In fact, 
Um, here we go. 11.2 says, But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months, which equates to three and a half years, or 1,260 days, if you want to put that in there. Uh, 42 months, three and a half years, or 1,260 days. Now, again, we talk a lot about numerology in the book of Revelation. So, so here's a number to grasp. The three and a half will come up several times. Uh, and, and I look at three and a half this, year, at this way. Three and a half is half of seven. Seven is considered the number of perfection, the number for God. So three and a half is, is incomplete. Uh, it is imperfect. It is partial, and it denotes evil. So evil is happening uh, while this verse of Scripture is going on. Uh, it says in chapter 11, verse 3, uh, we meet the two witnesses. And the two miracles they perform in verses 5 and 6 remind us of what two Old Testament characters. And they have you reference Exodus 7, chapter 7 through chapter 12, lots of scripture. 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, 10 through 14, and 1 Kings 7 through 1. But I think you guys are much smarter than that. So I bet I can give you the verses in Revelation, and you're going to go, oh, I know who they're talking about. So let's try it. Uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 3 says, uh, And I will give you, uh, give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap, and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. So there's, there's a hint right there that their position in the throne room of heaven is about as close as you can get to God without being at God's right or left hand. I mean, this is like, like close up. So there's your first clue. Uh, verse 5 says, If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths, consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. I have to tell you, I, I was working on stuff in here today, and I was putting all my stuff in, and, and I left that up on the screen like all day. And I thought, well, I hope nobody comes through to visit the church today. That's kind of a scary passage of Scripture to have up on your, up on your screen. Uh, I don't think anybody came in to tour, so we were, we were lucky today. Uh, verse number 6. Here's, here's your big clue. They have the power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans in the blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Big clues right there without reading all those other peripheral passages of Scripture. So you guys have probably already figured out the two witnesses are similar to whom? Moses and Elijah or Elijah and Moses. So if you guys got that right, uh, you give yourself, give yourself uh, some extra kudos there. Um, Moses and Elijah, because Moses parted the, parted the rivers and Moses uh, struck the ground with plagues and Elijah stopped the rain uh, for a long time. Cindy, uh, Cindy has a question. So are they going to be recognizable to people I don't, as well, Moses the, and this Elijah? Says, it, I, understand, I, I thought about the same thing. Uh, it says it would be similar to, but again, would you rec we wouldn't recognize Moses and Elijah. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, you know, Peter looks as close to Moses as possible. I mean, I mean you know, by that, time, by that time, folks may not know who Charlton Heston is. Uh, so they will have no idea what Moses looked like. But I thought the same thing. Is it actually, or is it just similar to? Uh, it's a good question. Good question. Who was it the other day said that, uh, oh, Brian, Brian's not here. He said that one of, the, one of the stories he remembers, not about Elijah, but Elisha, who followed Elijah. He said one of his favorite stories uh, is when, when the kids started making fun of Elisha for being bald, and he calls the bears down from the mountains and they eat the kids up. 
He actually had that highlighted on his phone. You need to ask him about that, Craig. <laughs> so that's his favorite one. Um, so what happens to the two witnesses uh, in verses 7 through 11? I keep extending what's in your book, so we're going to, because I want you guys to be in the loop. So verse 7. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them. Verse 8. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. Verse 9. And for three and a half days, that again, that number three and a half, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. Verse 10, all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. Remember, the inhabitants of earth at this time uh, were the folks who weren't taken in the rapture. Now, remember that what's happening while this is going on, there are people that are having an aha moment. And they're giving their lives to Christ in the midst of all this tribulation that is happening. It's not a large number, as you would hope to think that with this going on, you would have conversions right and left. But, but there are still people whose hearts are hardened and cold, and they gloat over what has happened to these two prophets of God. Verse number 11 says this, uh, or actually that's the answer. Verse 11 says, They will be killed and their bodies laid into the streets of Jerusalem for the entire world to see. They will be killed and their bodies will be laid in the streets of Jerusalem for the entire world to see. Uh, so that is, that is what will happen to them. That goes in your, in your blank there. They'll be killed and their bodies laid in the streets of Jerusalem for the entire world to see. Now, if you go back and remember what we read in the first part of those verses, God protected them, but there come that moment when God said, okay, their mission was complete and they were killed uh, and their bodies were there laying in the streets of Jerusalem for the world to see. Now, verse 11, because this is where it gets good. Verse 11 says this, But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them, and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. So, so God turned that table. And it made me think, I jotted down uh, in my previous notes this, this difficult thought. The role of God's people, you and I, especially the role of God's people post-rapture, is to witness first, not to focus on survival. See, we're kind of, we're kind of a survival mentality people, uh, and, and what, what our role is as a follower of Jesus, witnessing comes first, survival comes second more so post-rapture uh, because you realize that if you are a believer in Jesus post-rapture, uh, you are in a minority of minorities and, and the forces that be are trying to eradicate you so you don't spread any kind of message about Jesus. Uh, and so we see that these two witnesses were, were killed. All right, top of the next page. It says the ability to see this happening all over the world could indicate the use of some time, kind of television satellite. Uh, and you can tell this was written about 20 years ago. Uh, oh, we turn the page. Guess what our liturgy is? We are not here. Amen? Okay. Trumpet number seven. Uh, remember, the sixth trumpet happened way back in chapter 9, verses 13 through 20. So we've had an interlude uh, in chapter uh, chapter 10 and, and part of 11, the seventh trumpet. In 11.15, the seventh angel sounds, and we see a brief period of what is to happen during the remainder of the tribulation. 
uh, what you read in there is the announcing of the arrival of Jesus as the king. Uh, Jesus is being announced as the one who is coming in glory. So it says, what does John see in the temple in chapter 11, verse 19? It says, then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. So the ark of God, the ark of the covenant uh, was seen by John in the temple of God. You see, for the Jewish people, there, was, there is no record of the location of the Ark of the Covenant following the Babylon, Babylonian captivity. Uh, back in 586 BC, the, the Ark disappeared at when the temple was destroyed and it had not be, had been seen since that moment. Uh, and this was before Indiana Jones came out. Uh, so, so John didn't have that vision. It's not in a warehouse in Arizona. Uh, it is in the, in the temple, uh, in the throne room of God. John sees the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark is a symbol of God's presence with Israel and it indicates that the time of Jacob's trouble is almost over. Now, remember Jacob, the, word, the name Jacob is synonymous with Israel which is synonymous with the Jewish people, interchangeable. So if you read, you go, what, what do you mean by Jacob's trouble? Jacob was named Israel, and, and Israel were known as the, as the Hebrews, were known as the Jewish people. So all four of those actually are correct in saying that. All right, chapter 12. Uh, this is, the coming judgment here uh, are no longer partial, my friends but complete in their scope of destruction. So chapter 12. Chapter 12 is a description of a war first on earth and then in heaven and then on earth again. It is a battle of good and evil. It is the macro version of our own individual human struggles where we struggle between good and evil. Where, you know, we have that symbolic the devil's on one shoulder and the angel's on the other and they're whispering in our ears our struggle between good and evil this is the macrocosm the battle of good and evil and the forces of heaven are led by michael the archangel so uh, there are two main characters uh, in this chapter the woman and the dragon the woman represents god's chosen people from whom the messiah in verse 5 and through him, the church, in verse 17, were born. Uh, oh, I might back up. Verses 7 through 12, if you want to go back up to that previous paragraph and kind of uh, star that or highlight that, uh, that is considered by, by theologians as the recording of the fall of Satan when he was cast from heaven. Uh, and that scene actually happens out of sequential timing uh, because this happens kind of retro back to when... Uh, he was kicked out of heaven way back, but they include it. John includes that in this vision here. Remember, we don't talk about chronological timelines in Revelation. We talk about loop-de-loops, and this is one of those loop-de-loops. Okay, so uh, who is the dragon, and what does he try to do in chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, and chapter 9? So let's look at that. Chapter 12, verse 3 says, Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Verse number 9 says, The great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down into the earth with all his angels. So our answer in that blank is, he is Satan who tries to devour the ch children who is, or the child who is the church. And, and Satan attempts uh, to steal the church through very well disguised 
deception. Tries to, uh, tries to devour the child who is the church. Tries to, to steal the church through carefully disguised deceptions. I, I might say this, that, that one thing to note is that rarely, uh, rarely does Satan try to destroy us or tries to destroy the church by, by overt means. Uh, he always works covertly. He is the great deceptor. He is, he is the master at making things look right when they're not. So it takes a great amount of Holy Spirit discernment to know what is truth and what isn't. Uh, he, he does not blatantly make it, uh, make it false. He carefully disguises it. So it has the appearance of truth when it is actually rotten. So, so just be careful. That, that's how Satan works. Chapter 13. In this chapter, there are two beasts, not to be confused with Satan. These are two of his special demons. The first beast comes from the sea and is a composite of the four beasts that represent successive world empires mentioned in Daniel 7. However, it is clear that this world power goes far beyond any historical world power that is yet to exist, verses 6 through 7 and 8. But there is another beast described in Revelation 13, chapters 11 through 18. Uh, and it talks about uh, the beast has the horns of a lamb but the voice of a dragon. Now think about this, a deception. The appearance of a lamb trying to duplicate the appearance of Christ. But in reality, inside of it, it has the voice of an evil dragon. So the purpose of this second beast is to promote the worship of the first beast. At no time does it promote itself in verse 12. So what does the second beast try to do? And we're going to read verses 11 through 15 uh, from chapter 13 to get the answer. So here we go. Uh, chapter 13, verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and it required all of the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Hmm. What does that sound like? A fatal wound had been healed. Verse 14 says, And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform, oh, I'm sorry, verse 13, He did astonishing miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. Verse 14, And with all the miracles... He was able to perform on behalf of the first beast. He deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Verse 15. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it would speak then the statue of the beast commanded that ever, anyone refusing to worship it must die. Whew. Okay, so what's all that mean? That means that this, this second beast would perform miracles and get people to worship, worship an image of the first beast. To get them to worship the image of the first beast. Now remember, those who are worshiping are the folks whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life yet. They are the ones who have rejected Christ. So it's easy to trick them into worshiping this false god. Uh, but do you see the similarities there? How easy it is to massage, oh, this person was dead, but now they're alive. This person was this. And, and it just it, the, Satan is a master deceiver uh, when it comes to, to making us look foolish. So, perform miracles and get people to worship the image of the beast. All right, top of page 213. Guess what? We are not here. All right. 
especially as we get ready to talk about what we're talking about now. We are not here. The second beast will force people to receive a mark. The word mark means to impress or to stamp. Without this mark, uh, they will be, un be unable to buy or sell, verses 16 through 17. What is the mark according uh, to actually chapter 13, verses 16 through 18? So let's read what it says. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. See the scope of this? No one escapes it. To be given a mark on the right hand or the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Here we go. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one, let, let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is six. Six, six. So your answer there, what is the mark? The number of the man, six, six, six. Uh, now, again, let's talk about numerology. What we say seven was what? Perfection, completion. Uh, then six is the threefold reputation, a repetition of six, right? Six, six, six. The Antichrist falls completely short totally deficient uh, to measuring up to God. Uh, and actually, this if you remember from last week, this mocks God's seal that he has on the believers that is invisible that we read about in chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. It's mocking God again. Uh, now, um, there's been so much speculation on 666. Anybody that has ever been bad, somebody has tried to make the numbers fit. In fact, it was interesting that Nero, who was the emperor uh, that started most of the persecutions against the Christians, uh, it's believed that his Roman name, uh, calculated in Roman numerals, come out 666. I can give you a half a dozen presidents where I've seen them work it out to be 666. Uh, but what did we say at the top of this page? We are not here. And if we are not here, then that person isn't here yet. Amen? So, so we, can, we can spend a lot more time with the urgency of getting people saved than we can the urgency of sitting with a calculator trying to, trying to make your next-door neighbor that you don't like come out at 666. Amen? Also note, uh, no one knows for sure the exact meaning of the number, but it will play a principal part in identifying the Antichrist in that proper time and day. Those who accept the number, whether willingly or deceivingly, display their allegiance to Satan and their rebellion against God. Those who accept the number, whether willingly or by deception... Uh, are displaying their allegiance to Satan and the rebellion against God. So, chapter 14. Uh, this chapter is really a miniature glimpse of the rest of the book. It is like a table of contents for the re remainder of Revelation. It describes very briefly the establishment of the kingdom, verses 1 through 5, the vials of wrath, uh, 6 through 13, and the Battle of Armageddon, verses 14 through 20, all of which we will study in detail in later chapters. Chapter 15. Uh, this chapter is a prelude to the seven last plagues, which are not described until chapter 16. The people mentioned in this chapter are apparently those who suffered persecution and death from the beast in chapter 13, post-rapture believers, those who came to their senses, although it took a lot to get them to come to their senses, they came to their senses post-rapture. And so they're the ones that you read in chapter 15 uh, that were persecuted from the beast in chapter 13. They sing the song of Moses, praising God for his mighty acts, Revelation 15.3 and Exodus 15.1. Uh, 
Uh, in Revelation 15, 5 through 8, John sees seven angels coming out of the temple in heaven. They are commissioned to pour out the seven golden vials or bowls full of the wrath of God. Friends, this is the final and complete judgment of God beginning. Do you remember the people that say that used to hold the sign, the end is near? Well, they'd scratch it out and it says the end is here. I mean, we are at the end. The, the culmination of the entire planet of Earth, human history, is down to the last couple chapters that we have here. Chapter 16. The first vial, soars. Some believe that the method of marking people with the mark of the beast will cause the mark to become infected and incurable. Yeah, go ahead and take the mark and God will put the exclamation point on it. Uh, the second vial. The sea turns to blood. Verse number three. Already one third of sea life has been killed. Now everything in the sea dies. So begin thinking as we read these uh, bowls of wrath, what the effect will be have on humanity as well as the effect that it has on, on planet Earth uh, when, when all of this begins happening. Verse uh, number three, the third vial. Rivers turn into blood, verses four through seven. This judgment, which is very similar to the third trumpet, yet much more severe, will now affect all the rivers and most of the world's water supply will be lost. And that is fresh water, drinking water. The, that means the loss of life on an unimaginable scale. I thought this is a great line. I love this line. Those who rejected Jesus' blood will now be forced to drink water that is like blood. All right. Top of page 214. And guess what? We are, we are not here. Don't you just love that? I love that. All right. I'm not here. You just walk up to somebody and say that this week. We are not here. All right. So let me tell you, if we are not here, the only ones that are left here are the hardliners. Uh, they're all that are left on earth. Those who are totally thick-headed and resistant. So the fourth vial, the sun. In this judgment, the sun intensifies so men are scorched with the heat. Some believe nuclear weapons will destroy the ozone layer that protects the earth from the harmful rays of the sun. Absolutely possible. And if it doesn't happen during you know, the opportunity for nuclear weapons, who knows what is created by humanity on down the road that even makes it more prevalent. What do the people do as a result of this vial in chapter 16, verse number 9? Well, let's see. It says, everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God. So there's your first part. It's a two-parter there. They cursed the name of God who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give Him glory. Even then, as they cursed the name of God, they would not yield of their pride, their arrogance, their selfishness, and repent of their sins. I mean, it's like right out there in front of them. They see the world falling apart around them, and they're still resistant to giving God due glory. So, curse the name of God and they did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. All right. The fifth vial, darkness, verses 10 through 11. This vial is directed to the throne of the Antichrist. This darkness will have grave physical effects on people. What will they do in verses 10 through 11? Well, let's find out. Verse 10 says... The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish. Now let me clarify, if you are still around, then you are a subject of the beast. So, so you're, you're in this hot water as well, really hot water. 
and it's in darkness. They ground their teeth in anguish, but it goes on. Verse 11 says, And they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. You might just put C above, answer. <laughs> kind, of, kind of see the pattern there? All right. Okay. Here we go. The sixth vial. Um, I would say, let me add this before we get to the sixth vial. I was reading stuff in there. I, the, you know, I love this guy, but he, they've gotten fancy on me. Because all the, you know, your, your little areas to write on the margins, they've got all these fancy little drawings in there. Well, it gets in my way of writing stuff. So I got stuff written down that needs, it's, it's confusing. So anyway, as, as the false kingdom of the devil begins to crumble under the effects of these first five vials, these first five bowls of wrath, the Antichrist's power diminishes, is beginning to be exposed for being a fraud as these happen. Um, so, here we go. Uh, the sixth vial, verses 12 through 16. The Euphrates River will no doubt be the eastern boundary of Israel at this time. And, uh, and what we discover, know about the Euphrates River, before we get to our question is, if you go back to Genesis, uh, in, in the creation, when the Garden of Eden is established, there's a river that runs through the Garden of Eden. And then it branches out into four different rivers. And one of those rivers is the Euphrates River. It was seen as one of the, one of the main rivers of recognition. And so for John to have this vision about what's to happen, uh, the Euphrates River uh, dries up. And so uh, in, in a covenant between God and Abraham concerning the promised land, what does God promise uh, in Genesis 15, 18? Well, let's look there. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Lots of land there. So, so the answer is that God has promised to the descendants of, of Abram the land that exists between the border of Egypt to the great river of the great Euphrates River. In the north, the Euphrates River. In the south, the land of Egypt. Uh, so that is the boundary that God promised them. Some have argued persuasively that Israel at one time possessed all the land promised to Abraham in Genesis 15, 18. As a study of 1 Kings 4, 20 and 21, and 2 Chronicles 9, 25, uh, or 2 Chronicles 9, 26, is supposed to prove. There is a resemblance between the border of Solomon's kingdom and the land promised by God to Abraham. However, even at the height of the kingdom of David and Solomon, only a part of the land was actually possessed. And tribute was received from the rest, which means they didn't possess it. They just were powerful enough to exercise uh, tributes from the people who lived there. Therefore, at no time in the history have the Israelites actually possessed all of their inheritance. So look at the map on page 216 and answer these following questions. So we get to the top of the page. And remember what we're supposed to say? We are not here. All right, you guys got it. So today, if Israel were to possess the inheritance promised in Genesis 15 through 18, what countries or portions of countries uh, would they have to conquer? Well, here's the listing. Uh, they would have to conquer Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Egypt, and Iraq. Six countries that are part of on that map that would be required. Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Egypt, and Iraq. All of those, as you know from a student of history, are pretty powerful countries. Uh, the next question is, what modern-day superpower would this edge them closer to on the Northeast? Very simply, Russia. 
I also put on there, it also brings them up to the border of Iran, which is also, uh, they're flirting with becoming a superpower. Uh, they have nuclear capabilities, so they're nothing to sneeze at. Uh, so that's, that's pretty aggressive. It may seem an impossibility for Israel to conquer all of this anytime soon, but one must remember in the Seven Day War of June 1967, how many remember the Seven Day War of June 1967? See? So most of you don't. Some of you weren't alive. Uh, the Israelis more than doubled their territorial borders from 1948 when they were established as a nation uh, set up by the, by the UN uh, to, to 1967. In seven days, they doubled their borders. Uh, verse 13 and 14 of chapter 16 describes the three unclean spirits, uh, probably Satan, the Antichrist and the false prophet who deceived the nations into a last desperate rebellion against God. The nations gather at a place called Armageddon. The word Armageddon simply means mountain of Medago. Now let me say the exact location of Armageddon is unknown by anyone except God. So, and I think God has this by design because you can imagine uh, what, kind of, what kind of tourist attraction that would be. Uh, folks rushing to, to the place of Armageddon, waiting. You can buy a little trinket. Uh, you can take it home and put it on your fireplace mantle. Uh, God keeps that mysterious, just like, just like the burial place of Moses. Folks who are reading the Daily Walk Bible, a couple you know, weeks ago when we went through the end of Deuteronomy, it says that that Michael the archangel took Gabriel, or Gabriel, or Mike, I don't know which one, Michael or Gabriel, anybody remember? One of the archangels took Moses and buried him in an undisclosed location. No human knows where that is. No human knows where Armageddon is for our own good. So, so you know, don't like, pull out a map and let somebody put a pen in it for you uh, because you're trying to play God. We just don't know where it is. The seventh vial. Earthquakes and hail. This will be the world's most devastating earthquake. It appears there will be a complete renovation of the earth caused by this quake. To add to this catastrophe, hailstones weighing a talent, which is approximately 75 pounds, will fall from the heavens. I don't know if any of you were in the hailstorm a couple weeks ago. They weren't 75 pounds. Well, it's actually 75 Yeah, you have an old one. They, they recalculated a talent. So you imagine, I mean, the damage that the hailstorms did that were a size of what, baseballs? Uh, millions and millions of dollars of damage on the north end of town here. Uh, now, make, take it from a baseball to a 75 pound uh, ball of ice falling from the sky. Devastating. Um, verse 17 is notable to say, uh, very familiar words, it is finished. Who said that before? This week, a couple days from now. Jesus from the cross. It is finished. From the throne of heaven, at this point, at the end of the seventh vial being poured out, God looks and says, it is finished. In spite of the severity of these judgments, some people will survive and will continue to blaspheme God. Chapter 16, verse 21. Friends, there be no mistake. After all of the vials of wrath, the people who actually still exist will insist on cursing God. They are certainly, certainly beyond the capability to turn from their sinful ways and are worthy of God's final and full judgment for their eternal destiny. They get what they deserve. So that is, amazingly, gosh, I got through there much faster than I thought I would. So I have one other thing I want to show you because I kept saying, oh, I can't remember the name of the movie. I remember the name of the movie now because I went and looked it up. Um, it was actually a, well, what's a four, four thing movie? A quad for V, maybe, because a trilogy is three, a quad for V, whatever it is. New Jimism. So at the four movies, 
that make up the book of Revelation from the 1970s. In fact, 1970, 1972, uh, the movie A Thief in the Night came out. And so you can imagine it's a 1972-looking movie. An eerie song that's been actually covered by many artists. Uh, Randy Newman, remember Randy Newman, Spirit in the Sky guy? Uh, DC Talk. Uh, who saw the movie The Jesus Revolution? Have you seen that? It was actually covered in the, in the movie The Jesus Revolution. Uh, and it's called uh, Wouldn't We All Be Ready? A great eerie song. And it talks about this. and talks about Matthew 24. Um, and so that's, that's a great song. It kind of sets up the reality of the rapture. Uh, and then a, thief in, or a distant thunder uh, begins that which happens uh, with the beast and with the Antichrist, uh, with the mark of the beast, uh, and, and the image of the beast is the third movie. And I don't think I've seen The Prodigal Planet, so I, I can't tell you anything about it. Uh, and it's been 35 years since we started watching A Thief in the Night the other night before bedtime, because uh, we, we did find it. Um, and like I said, it's a 70s movie. Uh, but so if you're interested, it's that. You can also, uh, you know, they did the, the Left Behind series back in the, what, late 90s, early 2000s uh, with what, what's his name? Um, yeah, Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron. Uh, they're 90s movies, uh, again. Uh, but again, it just kind of gives you an opportunity to visually see what some of the stuff we're talking about. Remember, it's, it's Hollywood. Even though it's Christian bent Hollywood, it's still Hollywood. Um, so... Any questions? Oh, see, there it is. That's, I, I tried to, see, I'm not very smart. I tried to put the video of her singing that song in there for us to watch on the way out, but I didn't. I got the picture, but not the song. I can sing it for you. Okay, okay. You can go, you can go find it on Google. Go YouTube it. Uh, any questions? Oh, wow, so, to, so next week we wrap it up. And the no, nice part about next week, we go chapter 17 through chapter 22. Chapter 21 and 22 are the good chapters. So 17, 18, and 19 is the culmination. Chapters uh, are 17, 18, 19, 20 are the culminations. 21 and 22 uh, are the descriptions of the new heaven and the new earth. And all that will change. We got another question, Peter, over here, Cindy. So the number 666, there's all these fears running around about, you know, somebody's going to do that. So we don't have to worry about that because it's all fake. Is no, that right? No, it's real. We're just not, we won't be well, here we, when the it, real it, what, Whatever's yeah. happening now when they say, like in 2027, you got to get this thing or you can't buy groceries or, you know, whatever they come out and say, that's not well, real. Well, I, no, I won't say it. Let me put it this way. We don't know when the rapture is going to occur. And that could be absolutely 100% correct. But what I'm saying is, we're not in the midst of this happening yet yeah, now. So, again, my, my mantra is, save as many as you can. Save as many as you can before it happens. Uh, because you know what? Somebody's going to come clean this building. If it happens, then they're going to see a bunch of clothes sitting here. I hope you're not left behind. <laughs> if you are, fold all the clothes up, okay? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's difficult not to hear what's going on, see what's going on, say, yeah, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that we can trace back to Matthew 24 because that's kind of Jesus' uh, thing. But, but again, we don't know. So, so yes, don't be unprepared, uh, but don't be obsessed. Um, because I don't know the timeline from the end of chapter 4 to the appearance of the Antichrist. Uh, so I w if I was a wagering person, I would say that, that the Antichrist and the mark of the beast is not around yet. Uh, but I don't know if the rapture happened now. Well, I, I really don't care. But if it does, 
uh, I don't know how long from, from the rapture to chapter 17. Uh, there's not a timeline guide baked into the book of Revelation. Um, so, so, you know, again, my, my heart is to get as many people on board before it happens. Because um, I don't want to get there and go, man, I wish, I wish I'd have talked to that person. Uh, and they'll probably wish I'd have talked to them too by that point. Uh, so anyway, yeah, be aware, be prepared, but don't become obsessed is my caution. All right. All right, uh, tables go back tonight. Uh, sorry, I don't have a reason to keep them out. Uh, and uh, we'll pray and uh, you guys can visit and go home. Gracious God, I give you thanks for this wonderful day for, again, peeking into that which is strange and mysterious and, and the unknown. Uh, Lord, help us glean what is absolutely necessary uh, so that we would not live in fear, but we live in peace. Help us to live in a sense of urgency and not complacency. Help us to know what our story is so that we might help others know who you are. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks, so much. Yes.